Good morning, good morning, good morning. God is awesome. God is certainly great and God is worthy to be praised. Amen. Thank you for joining with us this morning uh, as we facilitate uh, worship service. We pray that what we share with you will be a blessing to your soul and that uh, you will be able to manage and to uh, persevere through this pandemic that we're facing, through this uh, social climate that we're in, this racial tension that we are experiencing at this time. I pray that, that the word of God will help you to endure whatever it is you are faced with, whatever trial you are going through at this time. Just as a reminder, keep in mind our sister Felicia Williams, the wife of Sidney Williams, lost uh, her uncle, and I believe it was due to uh, uh, complications from the COVID virus. And so please keep Felicia Williams in your prayers. Um, of course, uh, Sister Hall, Katrina Hall, Irvin Thomas, all of those who are on our prayer list, um, please keep them in your prayers. Uh, and I believe this is Rick Lovett. Um, he lost his mother, I believe that is, is that right? Uh, well, he stands in need of prayer in the Floyd family with the loss of their mother. So keep these people, keep our Christian family on your prayer list um, because we all stand in need of prayer one yeah. way or the other. Yeah. Um, we all stand in need of God intervening in our lives and, uh, and just showing up and showing out the way, only way, the only way God can. I want you to come with me to Job chapter 2. Come with me to Job chapter 2. And I want you to read with me in Job chapter 2 beginning in verse number 1. Job chapter 2 beginning in verse number 1. The Bible says again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, from roaming about on the earth and walking around on it. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. And he still holds fast his integrity. Although you incited me against him to ruin him without cause. Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has, he will give for his life. However, put forth your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh and he will curse you to your face. And so the Lord said to Satan, behold, he is in your power, only spare his life. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore uh, boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took a potsherd to scrape himself while he was sitting among the ashes. Then his wife said to him, do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? In all of this, Job did not sin with his lips. And as I said all earlier in the welcome, I want to talk to you from the subject, I'm in it to win it. Uh, amen. I, I'm in it to win it. One of the greatest lies and use of deception that Satan has promoted to Christians is that life as we know it should be easy. That if God is such a God of love and of grace that life should not have 
such troubles and such hardship and such adversity in it if God loves you. Well, I want to submit to you that God is not in the business of making us comfortable. God is more concerned with your character than he is your comfortability. And, and Satan has fooled a lot of people, even Christians, into thinking that life is, should be a cakewalk, that life should be easy if you're following God, and, and that if, if life isn't flowing as you would like it, then it presupposes by Satan's estimation that God isn't with you, God doesn't love you, God really doesn't exist at all. And if Satan can get you to strip away God from your life, well, when adversity comes, when you feel a little bit of uh, uh, uncomfortability, then God, if God is not there, then what Satan wants is for you to turn your back on God. Yes. And so you have to remember, God does not uh, have us with him and we are not walking with God per se for life to be easy, for life to be a life of comfort, for life to be a, uh, as, as the adage goes, roses and peaches, roses and peaches and cream and uh, roses if you would. That's not of God. And God never promised that life would be a breeze. What he did promise is that no matter what situation you find yourself in, eternal life is what you and I will have forever with God. Amen. And so we looked at last week, uh, what is your motivation? And we saw that Job had, was a man who had what I called a disinterested faith. That is, Job was not interested in following God for what he had or what God blessed him with, but Job was inter interested in following and serving God simply for who God was. Amen. And so Satan poses the wager, and he poses a similar wager uh, in chapter 2. As a matter of fact, the only difference in this wager that Satan poses to God is that he wants to now attack Job's health. Now notice, if we're going to be in it to win it, then the first thing you've got to re recognize is that proper representation is built on your preparation. Now you remember I told you on last week that you a prepared character must be necessary for premeditated adversity. Well, pretty much I want you to know that proper representation is also built on proper preparation. Now you, you may say, what do you mean by representation? What you're going to see is that God is going to actually pose again to Satan his servant Job. And what we've got to bear in mind is that if we are on earth representatives of God, then we've got to show forth our best presentation by our sureness of our right preparation. You've got to be prepared for warfare. You've got to be prepared for battle. What soldier, it would be foolish for a soldier to, to, to skip boot camp and go into a war and say to the sergeant, he's prepared. You've got to be prepared for war. And you need to know Satan is on a war path. Satan is trying to destroy not only Christians, but people out in the world. He wants no man to be saved. He wants no man to follow God. He wants all to bow down and worship him when really he has nothing to offer. But now watch it. Here's, here's what representation looks like. Notice the Bible says again, there was a day 
when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. And then the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord and said, from roaming about the earth and walking around on it. And then the Lord said to Satan, I told you so. Have you considered my servant Job? For there is none like him on the earth. Now, I need you to pick up on something. Here is God having another conversation with Satan, but then God uh, brings up Job again in the conversation, which means that apparently uh, after the first encounter, he went away and left Job, but now perhaps in his roaming about the earth, he saw that he needed to leave Job alone. Listen, the point I'm trying to make to you is that sometimes you need to not only bless God and thank God uh, for protecting you uh, concerning the attacks, but you need to also bless God and praise God for the attempts, for protecting you from the attempts. There's a difference in the two. The attacks is what you're actually facing and going through. But the attempts are sometimes, are sometimes unaware of uh, 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 factions that, that, that are trying to get to you. Satan apparently tried to get into Job's house, but he couldn't. The second time around, even when Job is at his lowest, he's lost everything. He's lost his family. He's lost his home. He's lost his servants. He's lost his, his cattle. And now God poses the question again as if, can't you see God being a little comical? Comical, and, and, and He said, yeah, Joe, uh, Satan, uh, I told you so. Because have you considered serve, uh, uh, my servant, Joe? Did, didn't I tell you the first time he was going to worship me for who I am? Why don't you consider him again? And do you not know God is the one who allows the adversity I'm going to show you Satan is, is actually the agent of the affliction. Watch this, though. Have you considered my servant, Job? But there's none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man. He fears God, turns away from evil. Now notice the difference in the phrase. He still holds fast his integrity. That's God talking about Job. And I'm telling you, the proper representation while going through your affliction is predicated on your, your ability to be properly prepared. You've got to make sure your mind is right for warfare. You've got to make sure that you are, I mean, we're going to look at it in 1 Peter in a minute, but you've got to know that if you are God's representative on earth, then it presupposes God is having a similar conversation to Satan about us, and you and I must put on our best representation while going through the adversity, or else you'll bring shame and reproach to the name of God. Amen. His prep, he says, have you, have you considered him? And he still holds fast. But can't you see God talking? Look, think about it. He said, listen, oh yeah, Satan. And guess what? He's still my child. Amen. He's going through the loss of his family, but he's still serving me. He's going through the loss of his cattle, but he's still serving me. He's going through the loss of his servants. He's going through the loss of everything that a man could have. His wealth has been greatly diminished, but he's still blessing my name. Can you still bless God's name when you don't have anything? Can you still bless God's name when your health is failing? Can you still bless God's name when life doesn't look uh, uh, promising? Can you still bless God's name when the bottom falls out? He said, look at him. He still hold fast his integrity. Are you in it to win it? If, you're, if you are, then you've got to make sure your representation is built on proper uh, preparation. Now watch it. Here's what I also want you to get. Job will be God's instrument to refute the accusations of Satan. <laughs> Don't miss that. 
Job will be God's instrument to refute the accusations, the false accusations, not only of Satan, but also Job's friends. Do you know what God does? I told you last Sunday, God never wastes an adversity in your life. And you know why? Because God will use you as his instrument on earth as a, representative, as a representative of him to refute the false claims of the agnostic, to refute the false claims of the atheist, to refute the false claims of the skeptic, those who don't believe in God. God says, well, look at my servant Fred. Look at my servant Susie. Look at my servant. They still worship me for who I am. And God, you've got to see yourself while in the adversity, you've got to say to yourself, this is just God's way of using me as his instrument to refute the devil and his lies. Watch this. The next thing you need to also write down is that our conditions or our circumstances will always con will often contradict our relationship to God. Notice that our circumstances will often contradict our relationship to our God. Now, notice Job, uh, the problem, the whole problem with Job's wife, the whole problem with uh, his friends is that they think that Job is receiving divine retribution for some sin he's committed. They think that Job has no integrity because how could he be going through this and still serve God? Well, I want to submit to you that you should never judge your situation by your feelings. You should never judge your position, your spiritual position by your physical condition. You know why? Because what you look like on the outside is never or should never define who you are on the inside. You need to know that God is using you as his divine instrument and his representative on earth to tell de the devil he is a lie. Oh, don't you know that's the word for the drug addict? The drug addict who's been over, who's overcome his, his drug, his or her drug addiction for years? Don't you know that God still has you here so that you can say the devil is a lie? If you want to know how powerful Jesus is, just look at me. To the one who's been molested and abused, just look at me now. God is the one who shows favor on my life. So you should never judge your spiritual position by your physical condition. And note that your circumstances will often contradict, right? It will often contradict our relationship to God, which means, church, you have to make up in your mind that life will not always be good. Yeah. Yeah. But my spirituality, my relationship with God will always be intact. Amen. Can, can, let, let me help you. Let me just go back to a scripture. Romans chapter 8 verse 31. That's one we always, we, we love it, but sometimes we read over it. And we don't, we don't take in all of what Paul says. Now, I'm telling you, your physical life has no bearing on who you are spiritually. Now, to the world, it may look like you're a failure. To the world, it may look like it isn't, it isn't worth serving God. But that has nothing to do with your spiritual relationship. Watch this. Romans chapter, Romans chapter 8, verse 31 says, What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? Mm -hmm. He who did not spare his own son but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one, watch it, who justifies. So I don't care how much Satan stands before God and brings accusations toward you and about you, watch this, which actually may or may not be true. Right. Guess what? It's God who vindicates you. Amen. 
It is God who, 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 who expunges your case. It is because of the blood of Jesus you are able to still stand here and say, look at my life now. Watch it though. He doesn't finish. He said, who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes. Wait a minute. Let me read that again. He says, who is the one who condemns? And let me just tell you, folk, never allow other people be, to be uh, the, 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 the judger in, your, in who you are. See, we got a lot of folk that spend a lot of time pointing their finger at other people, looking down at other people. Well, let me just give y'all some hope and some reassurance. If that person didn't die for you, that person has no right to judge you. Amen. Amen. Now watch it, watch it. He, as a matter of fact, and if that person can't intercede for you, that person can't talk about you. Amen. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Watch this. Next verse. Who will separate us. Now, here's what you got to understand. If, if, uh, if there's no man on earth, and there isn't, who died for our sins except Jesus Christ, if there is no man who can adequately intercede for us in the face of God, only Jesus, then why would you allow man or people or your circumstances to separate you from God? Paul is saying none of that, no one, no circumstance, no situation can separate you from God. Now watch this. He says, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation? Physical. Will distress? Physical. Will persecution or famine? All physical. Will nakedness or peril of the sword? Physical. All of it physical. He said, he says, who will separate us from that love? None of those situations can separate you. Now, next verse. Just as it is written for uh, your sake, we are being put to death all the day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But, but in all these things, it's a, con it's a conjunction of change. But, now watch this. All of the physical calamities are on the front side of but. Right? But God and God's power are always on the backside of the butt, which means by the time your calamities get to you, they won't overtake you because you've got a God on the backside who's empowering you to get through those adversities on the front side. You've got to have a but God in your life. Watch this. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. Look at that. Look at the power of that next verse. For I am convinced that neither death, nor angels, nor, uh, uh, life, nor death, nor life, angels, principalities, things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, death, or any other created thing, or any other created thing, will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. I like what Paul said. Paul said, nor any other created thing. In other words, your worship to the creator keeps you from being overcome by the creation. It doesn't bear fact. As a matter of fact, not, not any human or any circumstance can overcome you or overtake you as long as you remain faithful and steadfast to the God who loves you. Now, here's what Satan wants you to do. He wants you to believe that God is withholding his love from you. Therefore, he isn't worth serving because God couldn't love you if he allowed you to go through what you're going through. That's his deception, and that's the lie he wants you to believe. Paul would say, I beg to differ. Paul would say, nothing shall separate us from the love of God. No person, no situation, no pandemic, no, 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 no race amount of racism. None of it can separate us from the love of Christ. Amen. Now, let's come back to the text and let's, let's land, begin to land this plane. He says... Uh, the other thing, the other reason God chooses 
Job as a representation of him is because, get this now, he wants to know if you will be the same in your burdens as you were in your blessings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let me say that again. God wants to know. He uses you as his representation on earth in adversity because God wants to know, will you be the same person in your burdens as you were in your blessings? And that's a problem for some of us today because some Christians only want the blessings from God. We only want the goodness of God, but we don't want the adversity that God allows. And many of us fall down. We fall by the wayside. We lose hope. We lose faith. We stop serving God. We stop committing our lives to God all because we suffer a little adversity. And God said, well, I wanted to know if you were going to be the same in your burdens as you were praising me before in your blessings. Amen. I want to know. And so that brings us to another sub point in this, and that is the way God evaluates us is that God has to strip us from all that we think belongs to us so that we can surrender to him. Amen. Yeah, this, this is a little rough, right? God has to strip us from what we think belongs to us so that we, we can give him complete surrender. Amen. That's what God wants. Now notice, all of this, Job is not privy to this conversation. So Job, perhaps even in his mind humanly, is thinking, well, now I'll have time to grieve. I'll have time to get myself together. But the Bible says, and again, here, here comes the trouble again. Now watch it. Watch this. He says, after God says he still held his integrity, verse 4 says, Satan answered the Lord and said, yeah, skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has, he will give for his life. However, put forth your hand now, touch his bone and his flesh. He will curse you to your face. Now, so the Lord says all that uh, uh, he is in your power, only spare his life. Now, notice, Satan uses a proverbial saying uh, during that time, which was uh, a term that merchants would use when they went to the marketplace to trade animal skins. It was like a buyer's term or a trader's term where they say skin for skin. Now what Satan is saying to God is that, well, I couldn't get him the first time, but here's the problem with Job. The reason Job is really serving you is because he, his, his children died in his place. <laughs> skin for skin. His children, which would which, which, which suggest to God that Job is not only serving you because you manipulate him, but Job is also serving you because Job is selfish. He said it should have been Job the first time, yet Job, skin for skin, has been able to live and serve you still because his children died in his place. Look at how Satan thinks. That's why you need to understand you will always have, that's the second point to this, you will always have an antagonist to your destination. You will always have an antagonist on your destination. Now, if you don't mind, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, I need you to know, because the question is, if Satan will always be my antagonist towards my destination, how then can I live victoriously in my adversity? Peter's going to tell us how to do that. Now, go to 1 Peter chapter 5. Look at verse number uh, 8. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 8 says, Be of sober spirit. Yeah, be on the alert, for your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone, excuse me, someone to devour. Now, hold that. Peter says, if you want to live victoriously while in your adversity, he says the first thing you need to do is have a sober mind. What does it mean to have a sober mind? A sober mind is one who mentally is under self-control. 
This person does, is, is not easily swayed because the winds begin to blow or the rocks begin to fall. He, 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 this person is cool and calm and collected under pressure. Yeah. He's self-controlled mentally, which will lead to self-control physically. Now watch this. He said, be of sober mind. And then he says, be vigilant. Right? What does it mean to be vigilant? That means you are one who is awake. You are alert. You're sharp. You're always looking about. He says you are watchful. So in order to be victorious before the adversity and in the adversity, you got to always be looking for that old devil called scratch. Oh, yeah. Are you hearing what I'm saying? He said, and the way you do it victoriously, you are sober-minded and you are vigilant. I'm ever watchful. Man, and not just watchful for yourself. See, because what happens to us, Christians oftentimes fall prey to the devil's vices because we aren't looking. You got to see him coming. Now, here it, it's a parent. It's like a parent being protective of their child or their children. They are always watching, looking for some, some, some devilment to attack their children. They're always on the guard. You think about a mother. She's always on the guard, even if her children are 25, 30 years old. Isn't that right, Bob? Always vigilant. Always looking for the well-being of her children. Well, Paul Peter said, you've got to be the same way when it comes to the devil. Your adversary. He is one who stands opposed to God and God's purposes. Now, let me help you with that. The way you live victoriously is not by, uh, by pity parties and not by um, uh, depression or doubt or, um, or you begin to blame yourself. Peter says what you've got to understand the devil hates not you per se, but he hates God and he hates the purposes of God. Therefore, because you are walking and living in the purposes of God, guess what? That hate, you are the byproduct of his hate towards God. Let me help you illustrate that. You know, it, it's like, have you ever been in a situation where uh, uh, person A is your friend and person B is your friend and here you are in the middle well person a has a problem and an issue with person b well now because you are friends with both a and b person a is upset with you because you are friends with person b now you don't have anything to do with their issues between person a and person b yet person a has a problem now with you he doesn't like you. He doesn't get along with you now simply because you have maintained a relationship with person B. Well, if you can understand that, that's the same way the devil operates toward you. Because he hates God, person A, you've got to understand because you are in a relationship with Jesus Christ, Person B, you've got to know he's going to hate you. He's going to hate the purposes that you walk in. He's going to hate the favor that God has on your life. Not per se because of you, but all because he hates God. Amen. So you wonder why, why must you be in it to win it? Why must you be vested in your relationship with God? Because you need to know this adversary, this agitator, is one who hates God, and if he hates God, he ultimately hates you. Don't think just because you have little children and grandchildren, he hates them too. So it's your job to protect them by giving them the word of God. Amen. That's right, that's right. Now, no, notice, what else? <laughs> Excuse me. He says, uh, next verse. He said, but the next thing you need to do, not only be sober-minded, not only be vigilant, but he says, then you need to resist it. Now, this resist isn't you running. The word resist here uh, is one, it, it carries the idea of one who puts up a fight. This one, he stands firm, he withstands, it, it is a military term of which one puts up 
such a resistance that they strive against. So when Satan pushes, you push back. As a matter of fact, before he pushes, you are ready. You're standing firm. You are alert. You are vigilant because you're watchful. You are under control, right? And you are ready to put up a resistance when Satan starts to push. You push back. The problem with many of us and why we lose or we don't live victoriously is because when Satan pushes, we don't push back. We run. Or we, we or because, the, because Satan pushes us so hard, we end up joining him. That's what happens. He says, but no, you've got to be a resistor. You've got to resist him. And then notice how Peter says it. He says, resist him firm. Now, watch this. The way you fight Satan is by your faith. Right. Notice, he didn't say resist him by your, by your, by your, your knuckles. He didn't say resist him by putting up and, and swinging at people. He didn't say resist him by, well, how much armory you might have in, in, in the house. He didn't resist him by saying, go on and get a knife. He didn't resist him by saying, uh, you, uh, 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 you verbally assault him. He said resist him by your faith. Right. Notice, he said firm in your faith knowing that the experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brothers in the world. Look, look, let me give you another scripture. Look, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, I think it is. 1 Corinthians, is it chapter 10? Yeah, yeah, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Notice what uh, Paul would say. Paul would say, there is no temptation that has overtaken you such as is common to man, and God is faithful. Who will not allow you to be tempted of beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape so that you will be able to endure, <clears throat> to endure it. Here's what you got to get. Peter says, resist the devil firm in your faith. Now Paul says, you need to understand there is no temptation that will overtake you. You know why? Because God, who you trust in, is faithful. Yeah. He's so faithful that he will not allow you to be tempted beyond. In other words, God will not allow the temptation to be so overwhelming that it causes you to sin against it. Yeah. Look at how faithful God is. He was faithful to Job. He, he was faithful in the fact that he didn't allow the temptation to be so unbearable that Job would curse God to his face. Are you seeing this? He said so. And then he said, God will provide the way of escape that you will be able to endure. Now, remember I told you, Satan will push. Sometimes we don't push back. Here's the thing. When, and then, you know, my, my dad used to always say, listen, when, when you're getting tempted, and, that, and, and God provides the door for you, you better run through it. <laughs> Are you hearing what I'm saying? It's the same for, for all of us. God will always provide a way of escape. Now, 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 now notice, he's the antagonist, right? He's the agent of affliction, and he's the agitator of our peace. How do you know this? Because look at what happens. He gets to Job's wife. Watch the, watch the text. Come back to, to Job chapter 2. Satan went out and, and from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And as it said, that this, these, these boils were so debilitating. They were, whatever they were concerning his flesh, it made him unrecognizable. So much so, that's why his friends, when they saw him, all they could do is sit with him. And just look at it. Because they didn't recognize him. He, this thing is debilitating. Now Satan attacks Job, right? He, he attacks his health. So much so that Job has to go get bro broken pottery to scrape his skin. He's sitting by the ashes trying to relieve himself of this debilitating. As a matter of fact, so much so that if Job would have stayed in this condition, he would have eventually died from it. 
Here he is, scraping his body, trying to find relief. He's depressed. He's, he's dealing with the loss of his children, dealing with the loss of, of servants, his cattle being stolen. And, and to add insult to injury, the person closest to him says, do you still maintain your integrity? Curse God and die. Now, this is why Peter says you've got to be sober, you've got to be vigilant, vigilant, and you've got to resist the devil. Because Satan, as your agitator, will often use people close to you in your adversity to get you to renounce God. Mm -hmm. It may be a spouse who's not a Christian. It may be a family member who doesn't necessarily believe what you believe. It may be someone who may be even weak in faith. It may actually be another Christian. But you got to learn how to push back. You got to do what Job said. Job says, now you speak as the foolish woman. Because shall we not receive goodness from God as well as evil? Now the King James Version says evil. The word evil there does not mean moral evil as you would see someone killing another man. or the, That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about moral evil. The word should adequately be translated adversity. So God does not, he's not the creator of evil. God does not cause evil on people to destroy people. If you look at the text closely, you'll see that that's the agitator, Satan. That's Satan. I told you last week, God's original plan for Adam and Eve was not to suffer but, what, but to live in harmony with him. Even from the fruit and from the ground, the, the earth, they were to prosper. So that was never God's intent. Sickness was never God's intent. What this pandemic, now let me clear here, this pandemic was, is not of God, this is of the devil. Yeah. Now God will allow it so that God will eventually get glory from it. And guess what? God, not only is he going to get glory from the pandemic, God is going to get glory from those who represent him on earth. So he says, be vigilant. And then in order to be victorious, here's what I want you to write this down, tweet it, put it, whatever, however you want to do it. But I, you don't, do not miss this. The way you live victorious in adversity is by learning to see yourself past the trial while still in the trial. I'm going to say it again. You've got to learn to see yourself past the trial while still in the trial. That's victory. That's a mind that's sober-minded. That's a mind that's clear and rational and logical. That's a mind that is firm in one's faith. That's a person that says, even though I'm in the trial, I'm going to begin with the end in mind. In other words, I am already victorious. I'm already past this adversity. I'm already past this, uh, uh, this pandemic because it's God who gives me the victory. All right, and then lastly, lastly, church, you've got to accept God's sovereignty. Yeah. This is one of the things that Job struggled with after his health was, was stricken by Satan. Job in chapter 3 began to wish that he had never been born. Now, notice he doesn't curse God, but he curses the day he was born. He said, man... It had just been better if I had stayed in the womb. Been better if I just had not even been able to see life as it is now. Job struggled a little bit with that. And Job's friends struggled. But what God is going to do, God is going to prove uh, to Satan and to Job's friends that Job is right and God is sovereign. So he's doing that even with us. Now watch the sovereignty. You've got to trust it. Notice verse number 10. He said to her, you speak as one of a foolish woman speaks. Shall we accept good from God and not accept adversity? In all this, Job 
did not sin with his lips. Why didn't Job sin with his lips? Because Job says, listen, God was good when I was being blessed. God is still good while I'm going through such evil. God is still on the throne while I'm blessed. God is still on the throne while I'm suffering adversity. Can I show you a couple of other scriptures and then we'll, we'll land the plane? Look at Job chapter 42. Job chapter 42 and verse number 2. Uh, actually, Job, let's begin. Job chapter 9 and verse number 12, fellas. Verse, Job chapter 9 and verse number 12. Notice, he says, where were he to snatch away, who could restrain him? This is Job talking about God. He said, if, if, if God was to snatch away, who could stop it? Yeah. Then he said, who could say to him, what are you doing? Are you in it? So Job, at this point, even though his health was failing, Job still had enough faith and understanding of God that he, was, he would not dare ask God, what are you doing? Look at it. Now go to Job chapter 42, verse 2, I think it is. I know that you can do all things. Look at this, guy. And that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Yes. Don't miss what Job just said. He said, I know that you can do, you, God, can do all things and no purpose of yours shall be thwarted. You've got to understand if I'm going to uh, to live victorious, if I'm going to be in it to win it, then I've got to accept the sovereignty of God and I've got to know that whatever God has purposed for my life, Satan can never overthrow it. Amen. That's what Job is saying. Look at, look at Ecclesiastes, I believe it is. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 13. Notice, consider the work of God. For who is able to straighten what he has been? <laughs> oh, church, listen. He says, no man, whatever God decrees, whatever God has purpose for your life, whatever, when God's hand is on your life, nothing Satan can do to stop. God blessing you. As a matter of fact, let me say it this way. When God's hand is on your life, when God's favor is on your life, when God's purpose, when you are walking in the purpose of God, guess what? There is nothing Satan can do to keep you from going to heaven. What is God's purpose? For you to be conformed to the image of his son. What is God's purpose? To sum up all things in Christ. What is God's purpose? For you and I to be with him in heaven forever, praising the name of God. Amen. That's his purpose. And no man on earth and no devil in hell can stop God's purpose. Amen. So then, uh, this is the fact this sovereignty is the fact that God is free and able to do whatever he wills and that he reigns over all creation and that his will is the final cause of all. Now, that means you need to understand that when it comes to the sovereignty of God, when you accept the sovereignty of God, what, what, what motivates you to be in it to win it is that you know God favors the rejected. What do you mean? God always favors the rejected. Don't you know that it was David? You remember when David was out tilling the sheep of his father, tending to those sheep? And you remember Samuel came to, to anoint a king for Israel, and he calls all of the boys, David's brothers, together, and then each one of them he had to reject. God says, nope, that's not the one. And then he says, well, he says to David's father, isn't it don't you have a young lad out? He said, that young boy? out in, in, He's tending my sheep. That is the one that I'm going to anoint as king. God always favors the rejected. Don't you know it was Joseph who was rejected by his brothers? But guess what God did? Because God's hand was on him, because God, the favor of God was on his life, guess what took place? He ended up becoming, Joseph that is, the second man in charge. Because God favors the rejected. Don't you know it was Rahab the harlot who they rejected? Huh? But what did God do? He used her to bring about 
a, a safe avenue for the spies to spy out the land for Israel. But not only that, but Rahab, is, it is because of Rahab, Jesus comes through her lineage. What are you saying? God, re, God favors the rejected. And then it was Jesus who was rejected by many. Huh? And has now become the chief cornerstone. That every knee will bow. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. What are you saying? God favors the rejected. I know he favors the rejected. Because it's Jesus sitting between, uh, uh, nailed between two thieves. They were getting what they deserved. Jesus was bearing what he didn't deserve. And he was bearing it because those hateful Romans and Jews rejected his Messiahship. So much so that they couldn't even recognize that as he stands on the cross, he's, really, he's willing and ready to die for even their sin. Yeah. What's the point? God favors the rejected. So much so that they thought they were hushing the mouth of Jesus, that they buried him and Joseph knew too. But oh, on the third day, God raised him up and God has highly exalted him. He now sits on the right hand of God. What is the point? God favors the rejected. What is the point? That when you walk in the purpose and favor of God, the world may reject you, friends may reject you, family may reject you, church folk may reject you, but God always favors the rejected. And at the end of it all, God will raise you and elevate you only the way he can. What a tremendous blessing. And then, lastly, know that God, God will always end what Satan started. You got to keep that in mind. No, I don't care what Satan throws at you. I don't care how long this pandemic may last. I mean, I care, but I, I'm saying... Even if this pandemic goes another year, God forbid, but I believe, I just believe God is such an awesome God that he will put an end to whatever Satan has started. Amen. And you got to know that God is going to do the same thing in your life. Yeah. Do you know how I know that? Because the book of Job opens with the faithfulness of Job. But then the book of Job closes with the faithfulness of God. Amen. Isn't that right? Yeah. So what you got to know is I'm going into this. I'm in it to win it. I'm in it to, 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 to be the person that God wants me to be. I'm in it because I want God to, to mold and shape my character. I'm in it because I'm, I want to walk and live in the purposes of God. I'm in it because I want to make heaven my home. I'm in it simply because I love God for who he is. Amen. Listen, for those of you who are perhaps not children of God, I want you to know that God loves you. And I want you to know that the greatest lie told uh, by Satan is that God doesn't care because life is hard for you right now. Right. Well, I want you to know that uh, that circumstance that you're facing, uh, the trials you may be in right now, has no bearing over the relationship God wants you to have with him. You need to give your life to the Lord by believing in his son, repenting of your sins, and being immersed into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And church folk, family, I want you to keep in mind, God will put an end to whatever Satan started. Yeah. I want you to be reminded that God favors the rejected. I want you to be reminded that you and I are God's representatives on earth. Amen. And he uses our life he uses even our adversity for him to get glory from. God bless you. Stay with us as we continue through the furtherance of our service.